Uh, and we wanted to thank you for joining our webinar today regarding drug testing trends and challenges for 2019. As a legal disclaimer, we wanted to let you know that we have prepared this presentation for informational purposes only, and it is not intended to be substituted for legal advice. Should you have any legal questions, please direct them to your own legal counsel. Before we begin, I want to cover a few housekeeping items. If you are experiencing any audio or visual issues, please refresh the browser window by clicking F5 on your keyboard, or let us know through the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. In order, to, in order to receive HRCI or SHRM credit, you must attend a full live session of this webinar. Tomorrow you will receive an email from us with the HRCI and SHRM codes that you can use to submit your recertification credit. We will not be providing copies of today's slides. However, we will send you an email tomorrow with the link to the recorded webinar session that you can share with your team. After the presentation, we would appreciate getting your feedback. Please take our short survey. Let us know if this session was valuable to you and if you have any ideas for future sessions. Your host today for today's session is Dr. Todd Simo, Higher Rights Chief Medical Officer. You can review Dr. Simo's bio in the speaker folder, and we encourage you to follow him on Twitter. I will now turn it over to Dr. Simo. Well, great. Thank you very much, Corey. So, and thank you for everybody that attended. Uh, uh, you know, this is. You know, uh, over the last several years, I've kind of given this, you know, webinar uh, at the beginning of the year, and I kind of look at it as the, you know, drug screening state of the union address, at least from a higher right perspective. Uh, you know, I try to hit, you know, the relevant things that are on this agenda. So I always think it's important to, to look at positive rates and really look at it from, you know, what people are saying about their own drug using rate with the, you know, within the community, as well as how that's comparing to what the lab is seeing. So Quest Diagnostics, again, is a great partner here. They, they're, they're, you know, uh, upfront enough to share their their data with us uh, as an industry, and just so so we can see the trending uh, rate from a lab positive perspective, and then I always like looking at the you know MRO verified rate you know uh, of those because you know even if the lab rate is really really high, but you know. Um, the, if the MRO is overturning all of those things, you know, what you're seeing is what, you know, the MRO verifies as positive. Uh, you know, then it's my favorite uh, subject in terms of marijuana trends from a decriminalized process. So we'll talk about, you know, medical marijuana, you know, recreational marijuana, and then the, the growing trend uh, of CBD oil and, and people using CBD for, you know, medical conditions. So CBD is the, so to speak, acronym for a cannabinoid called cannabidiol. Uh, we'll give a DOT update um, just in regards to the impact of the federal ch uh, panel change as of last January 1st, as well as going through uh, uh, some updates on the clearinghouse and alternate specimens for, for DOT. And then we'll conclude it with just looking at uh, best practices recommendations. So the first you know, group of data will be the positive rate data. Uh, from this perspective, again, you know, SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, uh, sends out a survey every year that they call the National Survey of, of Drug Use. Um, and what ends up happening is, is they aggregate the data and split it up in a variety of ways. I think the, the, the way that's the most meaningful for employers out there is, is the population group that's you know, older than 26, because then you're capturing the people in the, so to speak, prime of their employment life. So when you ask, you know, the general U.S. populace that in the last year, you know, or, and more importantly, within the last month, have you used an illicit drug? And they mark illicit drugs such as marijuana, cocaine, methamphetamine, using a prescription medication uh, for its not intended purpose. They also have barbiturates and, you know, other things in there as well. So from this perspective, from 2013 through 2017, you can see that the, the that slope of the line is increasing. You know, it, it's up about two points over this period of time. So again, uh, from a population perspective, year over year, 
Uh, more people are reporting illicit drug use within the last month. And currently we're at a rate of about one out of 10 people that you see out there uh, have, you, you know, have admitted to using an illicit drug within the last uh, month. Uh, from this perspective, you know, let's look at it by drug class. So as you can see, you know, the trend is, is basically being driven by marijuana. So marijuana is, is in a trend line of an upward trend line. One of the good news here is prescription medications. So these are the, the prescription opioids primarily. And you can see that due to how the medical community and regulators have responded to the opioid epidemic, that there is kind of a, a, a downward trend, albeit small, but there is a downward trend of people abusing prescription medications. Uh, you know, when you start looking at methamphetamine and cocaine, you're really looking that, you know, a slight increase year over year in regards to total amount of, of stimulants being used. But the big driver of the increased, so to speak, illicit drug use within the past month is certainly marijuana. So let's look at that lab positive rate versus the self-reported drug use rate. So, you know, here urine is in yellow, um, and, and you can see that, you know, the trend line from reported drug use rate remains, you know, is what it is, you know, a few slides ago, so a markedly increased uh, upper increasing slope. And you can see urine is essentially you know, flat year over year at about 4%. So even though we're using as a society, uh, you know, more illicit drugs, urine isn't keeping pace with that and, and detecting more uh, drug use. When you look at it compared to oral fluid, you can see that the oral fluid slope line is actually keeping pace with the uh, reported illicit drug use line. Um, and that's a really important thing. So oral fluid is capturing, you know, recent drug use within the last one to two days in most substances and less than one day for marijuana. So all of these oral fluid positives are someone who's used the drug within the last couple days. And, and what you're seeing is, is that slope line is keeping pace with the, the slope line of the people that report uh, illicit drug use on a monthly basis. So again, you know, it shows a very favorable relationship. When you look at hair, again, hair, a different specimen, much larger, longer window of detection up to 90 days. But you can see the same thing with, with hair as we did with oral fluid, a very favorable relationship between self-reported use and actually lab detection rates. So now what I'm going to do is that was all lab data and lab data pre uh, presented through Quest Drug, Test, uh, Drug Screening Index. What I'm going to do is kind of uh, pull back the veil and say, hey, here's higher-right data. So we, we do all three specimens uh, and a fair number of all three specimens. So these are large sample sizes. From this perspective, year over year over our last four fiscal years, you can see that the urine MRO verified positive rate remains in the 2% range. So it's not increasing as we saw the self-reported drug use rate increase. It's basically saying at that 2%. Whereas when you look at oral fluid, you see an upward march year over year. So, you know, it shows a, a very favorable trend in terms of detecting more people and, and having MRO verify positive results. Here on the other end, you see is still two to three times that of urine. It bounces and it's lower. Some of this is just based upon many of our clients that are hair testing clients are long-term hair testing clients. They're, uh, you know, in programs that have a great deal of, um, so to speak, uh, promotion that they're a drug-free workplace, that we use hair testing. Therefore, they tend to attract less, less people to those companies that may be using illicit drugs, so there's a high donor fear factor with hair. So this is basically showing that the, the risk mitigation in those accounts is really good, and it is you know, showing that they, it's certainly superior to urine in regards uh, to overall detection. So when you look at the medical review effect, 
what you can see is 3.3% of all you know, urine drug screens seen at higher rate right, were laboratory positive. We ended up overturning about a third of those uh, because they had a reasonable and verifiable medical explanation for the result. Whereas when you look at oral fluid, we're over, only overturning about 10% of those results on, on medical review. And with uh, hair, again, it's about you know, a third of them that we're overturning on medical review. Uh, so again, our laboratory positive rate in hair is 7.6%. Again, it drops to 5.5% um, from an MRO verified positive rate. So what's the conclusions that can be drawn here? So, you know, there is an escalation in self-reported uh, drug use, and that's primarily being driven by uh, marijuana usage. Uh, urine positive rate is not keeping up with self-reported uh, illicit drug use rate. And in my mind, it's chiefly due to specimen subversion. So just to, as a sidebar to specimen subversion, um, and I'm going to give you, you know, one of my favorite statistics. Ten out of ten people doing drugs, illicit drugs, know it. So, you know, the people who are using drugs illicitly know it. When they're going for a pre-employment test or going for some sort of employment drug screen, particularly in the urine arena, there's all sorts of ways they can study for that urine drug test. So there's different ways that you can sur uh, subvert it by diluting the sample, which means, you know, using a natural diuretic that forces more water into your system, just overhydrating, which causes more water in your system. The less concentrated your urine, the more likely you are to have a negative urine drug screen. There's also a subversion in regards to adulteration. So there's adulterants out there that you can add to your urine that will metabolize the different components that the laboratories are looking for in regards to um, you know, the markers for cocaine or marijuana or such. So there's actually things that you can add to your urine that, that will be a marker, uh, you know, that will, so to speak, eliminate that positive drug screen. And then there's just pure substitution, and I think this is the area where the majority of, of real, um, so to speak, subversion of it. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that subversion goes in, in, into that the, the donor presents a yellow fluid that is 95 degrees. However, that yellow fluid that is 95 degrees didn't come from the donor. It was freeze-dried urine that they bought from the Internet, reconstituted and heated. It's synthetic urine that they bought from the Internet, which was heated. So, or it was someone else's urine that they brought in. You know, these are all, you know, so to speak, a substitution. They substituted their, their urine for someone else's uh, or, or something else's. And from a laboratory perspective, the lab is looking for validity tests in regards to acidity level, in regards to concentration and kind of viscosity of the uh, specimen. But those are the physical parameters that the lab, based upon the lab rules, are looking for. So the people selling synthetic urine create a yellow fluid that has all of those components in it uh, and also has creatinine in it, a breakdown product of muscle. So they're looking for those things. And when they, you know, when they see it, they call it, well, that's urine. And if there's no drug in it, they call it a negative specimen. So, you know, those are ways that, that donors study for the test. Therefore, you know, they have, you know, they're doing those, so to speak, you know, so to, to beat that drug test. Whereas in oral fluid and hair, there's really no good subversion measures in either one of those specimens. Next bullet point, the lab positive rate for alternate specimens is tracking with the self-reported illicit drug use rate. And, and then it's really MRO verified positive rate for alternate specimens is significantly higher than that of urine. Next two caveats are really part of the MRO process. The larger the panel, the higher the overturn, you know, MRO overturn rate. You know, many of our urine panels are, you know, 10 panel tests, which include illicit drugs plus many prescription medications. You know, when they're positive for that prescription medication and the person has a verifiable, you know, medical explanation for the result, you know, I have to verify that it's negative. It's a negative drug screen, uh, even though, uh, even though that was, so to speak, um, you know, a pause, you know, even though that was a laboratory positive. 
and I apologize, somehow my screen just went blank in terms of the slides. So, and from the next perspective, um, the, you know, the, so to speak, the longer the detection window, uh, the more MRO negatives you're going to have. So if someone uses a prescription medication like codeine and they're doing a hair test, but they use that prescription medication for codeine last month, that's certainly going to appear in their hair, but there's going to be a medical explanation for it. So I'm going to be overturning it to negative. You know, the shorter the detection window, such as oral fluid, what you're doing is getting the most recent drug use as part of that drug screen. So, you know, in terms of my, you know, interpretations of this is, again, urine isn't keeping up uh, as a specimen, you know, primarily due to subversion because urine as a specimen is very easily manipulated. And, and you know, urine has about a seven-day detection window for all drugs to include marijuana. So from that perspective, you know, Subversion is the real reason why urine doesn't have the same positive rate as oral fluid does, because people are, so to speak, able to game that urine test and can't game that oral fluid test. From the next perspective, oral fluid testing, even though it has the you know, smallest detection window, it has a very high lab positive rate. What you're catching with oral fluid is what the person is doing temporary temporally related to that drug screen collection. So you're getting kind of real-world drug use. Um, the MRO overturn rate is lower just because what we're looking at is a very narrow window. Um, and it is subversion resistant. One of the reasons that it's subversion resistant, it's observed specimen collection. You know, someone is watching the person collect the oral fluid from their mouth. So it's essentially like w w watching someone brush their teeth in the, the morning. And again, I speak internationally, and when I speak to colleagues in Australia, they say there's some, you know, adulterants available in Australia uh, for oral fluid because Australia, New Zealand use a lot of oral fluid for their testing. I just haven't seen them hit the United States. Plus, I have some questions on, uh, in regards to testing practices and what technologies that they're using that may be a reason that, that they're showing some subversion in oral fluid where we're not. Another reason is donors are surprised when you say, hey, we're going to do your drug screen. They have their freeze-dried urine in, in the trunk of their car. When you say, put this in your mouth, they, they really don't know what to do, you know, what to do at that point. And again, the donors that are caught, the donors that are, so to speak, confirmed and verified positive for whatever drugs are, in all likelihood, chronic daily users. And it's really that chronic daily user of marijuana, cocaine, methamphetamine, or anything else that causes you the most risk at work and the most risk to your job site. So interpretations of hair, very long detection window, up to 90 days. The lab positive rate is triple that of urine. You know, uh, you know, the reasoning for our MRO verified positive rate to be lower than, than oral fluid, I think to many instances is the deterrence effect. You know, the companies that we have that are hair testing, again, are long-term drug-free workplace program people. They do a lot of publishing on the recruiting site that we use hair as our specimen. And those companies are reaping the benefit of that, uh, of that, so to speak, deterrence. <laughs> Excuse me, because that person doing drugs will look at all of that and then decide, hey, I'm not even going to apply with that company. I'm going to go down the road and apply with the company where potentially I can gain the system. And, and you know, when you look at about the 33% of, of those um, hair testing laboratory positives that are overturned, primarily those are due to opioid prescriptions, some of which aren't even chronic opiate prescriptions. You know, I hurt my ankle. I was on hydrocodone last month. Hair is getting that in the detection window, whereas urine and oral fluid aren't. So therefore, the medical review officers overturning results just due to older prescription medication use. So that's kind of the, the trending over time, so the positive rates and the positive rates by specimen. 
now we're going to talk about, you know, decriminalized marijuana. So to a certain extent, this is Europe and this is the European stance. So some places it's illegal, some places it's kind of legal, some places it, it, it's completely legal. So again, from that perspective, uh, the United States looks really no different uh, than Europe because we basically have three buckets uh, uh, of different state categories as it pertains to decriminalized marijuana use for medical issues. So these are the medical marijuana cards and stuff. So from this perspective, it, it's really a third fall into each bucket. So the first bucket that you see the states are in red, these are the states that by regulation or by case law, employers in these states do not need to accommodate medical marijuana use. So therefore, if you're a medical marijuana user in California, an employer in California has no, um, uh, you know, has no regulatory responsibility to consider accommodation. They can just purely say that positive drug screen for marijuana is grounds enough for us to either not hire you or uh, dismiss you for cause. The next group of states, and leading the way was Arizona in 2010, are states that either by statute, so their compassionate care statute or medical marijuana statute, uh, explicitly states that there is, you know, the employers have the obligation to consider accommodation of medical marijuana users, that the positive drug screen alone isn't the reason not to hire or to fire someone, or the case law, and most specifically Massachusetts here within the last couple of years, case law was driven that, you know, Employers in Massachusetts, if, if a person seeks accommodation for their medical marijuana use, needs to consider accommodation there. So needs to go through and say, yes, you know, yes, based upon your job, we can hire you, or no, based upon your job, we can't hire you. So that's the next third bucket of states. And then the last bucket of states are really neither regulation or or case law addresses an employer's need to accommodate. So there's nothing that says you have to, but of course there's nothing that says that you shouldn't. So again, it's really up to the employer in those states. And I'm sure as time wears on that these states that are uh, you know, shown here in black will all of a sudden fall either into the red or the green category. So now we're going to go through decriminalized recreational marijuana. So again, now there are 10 states. There are 33 medical marijuana states currently. There are 10 states that have statutes in place or coming online in regards to you know, decriminalized marijuana use. And I really say decriminalized use here for recreational purposes and not calling it legal. So it's going to sound like I'm in the movie Pulp Fiction with John Travolta saying, you know, marijuana is legal, but not 100% legal in Amsterdam. You know, in the states that have medical mar or have decriminalized marijuana statutes, so you can use it recreationally, is in line that if you buy your marijuana from a state-sponsored dispensary, and you can only buy so much at a time, you can only possess so much at a time. Um, so it's kind of legal, but not 100% legal. So, you know, you can't have 20 pounds of marijuana in your trunk. You can't have marijuana that you buy in Washington and transport it to Oregon, even though both states have decriminalized statutes. So there's a lot of guardrails in place in regards to uh, the recreational uh, marijuana and the state rules. From an employment perspective, nine of the states in Washington, D.C., there is no need to consider accommodation. That in all of those states, you as an employer, if someone comes forward and says, I'm a, re medical, or a, a recreational marijuana user, you don't have to all of a sudden afford them any, so to speak, protections. You, have, you don't have to afford them a consideration of accommodation. The one state here, here that is different is Maine. So from a main statute perspective, you can still drug screen uh, for marijuana in Maine. However, if the person is positive for marijuana, 
you know, you, you know, you have to consider accommodation for that person, even if they're a recreational user. So if that, if, you know, if you're a trucking company or an airline or a train, that federally regulated stream, you have a compelling business reason and regulations that state you shall not accommodate. You know, if you have a high industrial plant there with multiple moving parts and a complex process where you have to lock in and lock out of safety sensitive areas, you may by business rules say we can't accommodate it based upon risk and safety. However, if you are running a call center in Maine and you have a positive drug stream for marijuana, you may not have a business reason as to why you can't accommodate that person's recreational use. Of course, within every state, whether medical or recreational, if a person is impaired on your job site, using on your job site, and even potentially possessing on your job site, those are all grounds for termination. But you can't just use the positive drug stream by itself in Maine to disclude someone from employment. You have to have a compelling business reason as to why you can't move forward for employment. So marijuana, medical marijuana, and the safety concern. So from a medical marijuana prescription, it, you know, uh, from a medical marijuana perspective, excuse me, it's not a prescription. It is a physician recommendation based upon a state statute for compassionate care. <clears throat> All those statutes were written to basically say, hey, if you know, um, if you are, are using drugs, you know, if you are, are using you know, prescription medications and they no longer help, and your physician believes that medical marijuana will help you, uh, you can now get medical marijuana from a state dispensary in a non-criminal way. So unfortunately, with it not being a prescription, there is no way, way to verify appropriate use. Because number one, medical marijuana is a plant. Uh, as a plant, you don't know which ones are rich in CBD and have lower contents of THC or vice versa. Uh, you don't know, you know, how often the person is using it because there's no pill. You know, back when I was a treating physician, if I saw a person with chronic pain and I prescribed them a pain pill, you know, and told them to use one once a day at bedtime. And if they came back after 30 days and said, oh, yeah, that worked well, I had a certain degree of confidence that they were just using the dose that I needed when I told them to. From a medical marijuana perspective, there's none of those controls in place. You don't know how often they're buying it. You don't know what dose they're using and really when they're using it. And drug screening by itself, particularly in urine and hair, there's no way to determine impairment. However, impairment can be ascertained when using oral fluid and blood. So, you know, so oral fluid as a specimen, you know, now can be used to make a determination of impairment where the other specimens like hair and urine cannot. So marijuana impairment, I think this is just worth, worth talking about. So everybody knows that if someone uses a marijuana that they become high. So they're acutely intoxicated. And that acute intoxication, depending upon how rich that, that marijuana product is in THC, may last you know, three hours or can be as long as six hours. And during that period of time, they show the normal you know, marijuana, quote unquote, high, where they're relaxed, they're sleepy, they're euphoric, and they really have impaired perception and motor skills. But the next part of this is, is there is growing evidence um, that marijuana is impairing for well over 24 hours after a single use. So, you know, when you use marijuana and you're acutely intoxicated, of course you're impaired. But there's evidence, uh, and this evidence is, you know, in people driving and people flying and people doing complex tasks, that you smoke pot. You know, yes, you create more accidents when you're high, 
but 24 hours later when we re-challenge you, you still haven't gone back to baseline. You still are having more accidents as it relates to complex motor skills, complex skills in relation to spatial perception. You know, so, you know, driving, manufacturing facility duties, all of those, um, when a person uses marijuana, they're not only impaired when they're high, they're also impaired when they're coming off that high. And the studies have gone out for 24 hours. There's some that have gone out for longer than that. So we can certainly say the marijuana impairment window after use is greater than 24 hours, which is far different than, you know, some other drugs like opioids. Opioids, there's actually studies that show with opioids that if a person's on chronic narcotic pain control, their ability to do complex functions actually improves over time as their body becomes accustomed to that narcotic. So this, that's something that's kind of different from an opioid perspective than it is from a marijuana perspective. So best practices recommendation for decriminalized marijuana is know the states that you employ people in. So again, and know what your company kind of stance is to it. Because some states require you to consider accommodation where the others don't. The next thing is, is really know your company's risk tolerance and employee profiles. Because even in the states that require you to consider accommodation, you may have employees that you can't accommodate. So to speak, you have a commercial driver you can't accommodate them. The rules say that you can't. You have someone who's in a highly safety sensitive position in your organization, you may have a compelling business reason as to why not to accommodate. So you have to know your risk adverse, you know, uh, you know uh, how risk adverse you are and how non-adverse you are. And when you're looking at you know, medical marijuana, you have to decide, or decriminalize marijuana, you have to decide whether or not, hey, are we going to afford the consideration of accommodation across every medical marijuana user, or are we only going to do it in the states that require it? Um, the third bullet point here is know the regulatory rules which apply to your company. Because there's, you know, sometimes if you have federal contracts in place or other contracts in place, it may stipulate that, you know, you have to follow the federal rule on marijuana, that you have to do something. So you just have to look at that to be aware of that because the state may say that you need to accommodate, but your Department of Defense contract when you're sending people onto that facility may be explicit that you cannot. And then the, the last real bullet point here is consider oral fluid testing. So oral fluid has a detection window for marijuana that's under 24 hours. As we went over in the last slide, the impairment window for marijuana is far greater than, uh, than 24 hours. Therefore, if you collect an oral drug, fluid drug screen, it comes back laboratory positive and MRO positive. You can say with a high degree of, uh, of certainty that the person was actually impaired when that drug screen was collected. And there are no states that offer any kind of or need, any need for accommodation for anybody who's impaired uh, at the time of collection. Next thing, CBD oil. So CBD, uh, you know, is cannabidiol. Again, this is another naturally occurring cannabinoid found in the hemp fam family of plants. And actually, the majority of the positive health effects uh, that the medical marijuana lobby uh, was pushing for is really not THC, which is the psychoactive uh, part of the marijuana plant that make people high. It's actually the CBD component which is great for both inflammatory and neuropathic pain and is actually the anti-epileptic effect, so the anti-seizure effect. Those all come from CBD and not THC. Uh, the medical community and the pharmaceutical uh, community, to their credit, has now uh, has a DEA Schedule V drug, so FDA-approved DEA scheduled drug called Epidulex. Um, so that's now available. It's original marketing or are for two forms of childhood epilepsy, but I'm sure there's going to be physicians in the chronic pain arena that are going to grab onto this and, and start offering this to their patients uh, for that inflammatory and, and neuropathic pain. Um, however, you know, 
THC from the marijuana plant, the, the, it still remains illegal from a federal perspective. So the DEA said, yes, CBD, which may be derived from the plant, is fine as long as you know, the THC has been substantially removed from that. However, um, you know, if there's large amounts of THC that remains in that CBD product, from a federal perspective, that is still illegal. And the big problem here is there's a lot of CBD products out there that come from manufacturers that may not be following that FDA-approved manufacturing process that takes the THC out of the CBD. You know, because these manufacturers are in states like Colorado where they have a medical marijuana statute. They're able to offer CBD oil in their, so to speak, uh, dispensaries, and, and they don't have to go through any kind of FDA process because they've already done a carve-out for that from a state perspective. And please be aware that CBD or, you know, CBD is not a medical explanation for a marijuana positive result because the marker that the drug streaming industry uses for marijuana is THC. And small amounts of THC aren't going to trigger off that test to be positive. You know, so therefore the scant amount in, in of CB, uh, THC that may be in an FDA approved CBD product isn't going to cause a positive drug strain. However, a product that may be massively contaminated will cause a positive drug strain. But once again, that CBD product that's massively contaminated is no longer, from a federal perspective, legal. Next is our uh, Department of Transportation update. So the DOT panel and the regulation change, what was the real impact here? And the date range I'm going to look at is the first six months of 2018 and compare that to the first six months of 2017. The, real, the reason I'm just comparing the first six months is in July, um, the DOT chain of custody changed. And with that DOT chain of custody change, there was a lot of, so to speak, affidavit process pursuant to 40.205 you know, uh, that, that made me go out and get affidavits if, if an old chain of custody was used. That introduced noise into the analysis that I just didn't want to put into scope. So I just really looked at, at those first six months of each year. So, um, Beyond just adopting the additional drugs, so we all know the DOT panel now includes hydrocodone, hydromorphone, oxycodone, and oxymorphone. There was also a rule put in place by DOT that said if you have a donor using a prescription medication that could impact their ability to work safely under DOT agency rule, that you as the MRO now have to allow that person five days to get uh, treating physician medical clearance before voicing any sort of safety concern to the employer. So before, in 2017, if a person was using morphine for chronic pain, I could verify the prescription and automatically release to you as a company a safety concern saying John Drivers on morphine, um, you know, treating physician medical clearance is, is required. If you don't have this, this is how you go about getting it. Well, now in 2018, I have to provide that donor five business days, so essentially one week, to get that treating physician clearance. So, I, I, you know, in our world, we delay that result in those five days so that when we voice to you a negative drug screen, we can also voice to you, you know, there's no safety concern, or we can voice to you, yes, we got verifiable proof, but his own doctor won't sign off that he's safe, you know, because then it goes into medical safety and fitness for duty. So that's one thing that, that came into effect that is delaying results. The next thing uh, that is really pertinent here is the amount of tests that have to go to further testing markedly increased you know, year over year, and the amount of lab positives increase. So in 2017, on higher rate data, 1.7% of our DOT strains were lab positive, and 1.2% of those were MRO verified positive. Well, in 2018, you can see that both numbers increased, that 2.6% of our lab results were positive, 
and, and we also had a 25% increase in the amount of MRO positive results too. So you saw two bumps. You know, prior to the panel change, I was putting out there thinking that the new DOT positive rate was going to be in the 2.8% range, and what we saw is a figure very similar to that. So we are getting much more lab, more lab positives, many of which we are overturning, many of which we aren't, but you're just seeing the amount of ones going, you know, going to MRO review is increased. Um, Next part of it is, is the amount that go to further testing is increasing, even though those specimens at the end of the day may not confirm positive for a given drug. So from every, when you look at any federally regulated lab, that lab is really set up to get that specimen into immunoassay testing very quick. So they're trying to accession the specimen and get it into immunoassay testing. Immunoassay is the technology, the approved technology that labs can come through and say, yep, that specimen has no drug in it. We don't have to do anything further with it. We can report to the MRO immediately that that drug screen is negative. Any time that the immunoassay says, hey, wait a minute, there may be drug in this specimen, the laboratory then needs to go through a very complicated a laboratory confirmation process where it is looking for the specific marker of marijuana, cocaine, amphetamine, methamphetamine, opioids, or PCP. Um, so it, it, that's a very complicated process that includes specimen prepping and extraction and things. So the things that we all saw Greg Sanders do in CSI over the commercial break is actually a several day process at the lab. So when more specimens need to go through further testing, you're going to have more specimens that are delayed results to the MRO and therefore you're going to have increased turnaround times. So what we saw in 2017 is essentially only 6% you know, of the specimens had to go to further testing from a DOT perspective. You know, 1.7% of those 6% were, MRO, or were lab verified or confirmed positive. You know, the rest of those were lab confirmed negatives that just needed to go through the confirmation process. However, in 2018, you know, that figure is now 11%. It essentially doubled the amount of specimens that had to go into com the confirmation testing arena. And therefore, you have a doubling of the amount of specimens that there was a laboratory delay in getting me the result as your medical review officer. Again, no one did anything wrong. It's just the panel changed. Therefore, the amount of specimens that need to go through the complicated um, confirmation testing process increased markedly. So what did that do to turnaround time? In 2017, in whole days, our DOT uh, turnaround time rate was 2.3% for MRO verified negative result. So those were the 94% that reported, you know, within the day that the laboratory received it, along with the 6% that took the lab a longer period of time. Well, in 2018, in those four first uh, you know, six months, the number is now three, three days. It increased. And the reason that, it, you know, part of the reason of that overall increase is, guess what? Those additional doubling of specimens going to, uh, you know, confirmation testing caused the delay, and that, that delay at the laboratory was a delay in me reporting to you that negative result, as well as the additional laboratory positives for hydrocodone and oxycodone that were MRO verified negative ultimately, you know, still had a tack on delay for the medical review and then the vetting of the safety process. So there was a lot more, so to speak, delays in the overall program, you know, based upon more laboratory work more MRO work, and a regulatory change on how I have to handle safety concerns. And this next slide really illustrates that, you know, if something needed, to, if something was immunoassay, you know, non-negative, had to go through confirmation process, you know, whether it was confirmed positive or confirmed negative at the lab, you know, this also includes MRO time. But in 2017, that 6% of specimens turned over in just under six days, 
where in 2018, that rate went up over seven days based upon all of those factors. So the 11% of specimens that needed to go through confirmation testing in some degree had a a longer turnaround time overall from both the lab, MRO, and then the MRO process as it goes through to vetting the safety concern with the tri treating physician. So my big recommendation from, uh, from a regulatory perspective for all the DOT clients on the, on the line is there are caveats within some of the DOT modes, particularly FMCSA, but also FAA and Coast Guard that allows you to basically, by, by um, company policy, compel your drivers from an FMCSA perspective to tell you what medications you're on so that you can have that safety concern, you know, so to speak, vetted before it even reaches the MRO. So that's actually a powerful part uh, of that regulation. Uh, also talk to your MRO, so whoever's performing your MRO service, how he, she, you know, alerts you you know, uh, of safety concerns and ask them how you can assist in vetting those concerns. Last part of the federal rule was the federal HHS Department of Human Health Services, when it was amending the rule, did make mention of oral fluid coming online. It still is an online from a federal specimen perspective, but it sure does sound like it's coming soon because HHS put it in the rule. But unfortunately, the cart is still in front of the horse here because the federal government hasn't released uh, oral fluid testing standards for federal purposes. So from a, the next kind of update is from a National Clearinghouse perspective, um, you know, this is very specific to FMCSA. And the, the go live date is still set at you know, January 2020. The FMCSA is gonna build the database itself. Uh, over the last about 18 months, there's been talk about FMCSA going out to RFP for it. It never did. They released something at the end of last year saying, no, we've decided to build it ourselves. From this perspective, this is something that every employer will have to go into uh, from an FMCSA perspective to see if that guy has a violation. As this database matures, your three-year look back for drug and alcohol policy violations will go away, uh, but you know, you'll have to run them in tandem. You know, companies like Hire right here, we are creating, once this database is up, we are going to create some sort of integration and, and have a product that you can, you know, add to your packages that will allow us to ping that database on, on your behalf. FMCSA has allowed that as, as part of the rule. Uh, update oral fluid for DOT. So again, uh, HHS has been working on this since 2012. Uh, they've wanted to move forward with oral fluid. They're, they're still waiting, you know, we're still waiting for the mandatory guidelines to be released. So we thought they would be released in 2017. Then they said, nope, it'll be 2018. Well, now it, they're, they're going to release it in all likelihood in 2019. What I hear from my friends in the Beltway is the thing that's holding it up is they're really looking at the best way to test marijuana in oral fluid. Today, marijuana is detected in oral fluid by as you inhale or eat a THC product, it embeds on your oral fluid membranes and that's what is detected. The metabolite of marijuana they believed wasn't in oral fluid. However, there was a doctor that discovered it's actually there. It was just kind of hidden. And therefore, HHS is trying to determine what's the best way to detect marijuana in oral fluid. Do we do it the legacy way that companies have done in their drug-free workplace programs? Or do we compel the labs to do it in this more advanced way where we can look for metabolite? So here, testing for DOT, again, we all know that President Obama signed the FAST Act in 2015, which told HHS that you have a year to create uh, hair testing rules. Well, as you can see, they've been trying to release a rule for oral fluid since 2012, and Congress didn't mandate that. HHS 
has gone along and is, and is vetting those things. But, but again, it's a several year process. There was a House bill released last year which basically compels HHS to report uh, to a committee, uh, you know, to a committee up on the Hill every month in regards to where they stand in, a, in both oral fluid and hair in adopting those things. But here is a much more complicated specimen than urine or oral fluid because the specimen itself isn't homogeneous. Everybody on this call has something different with their hair, you know, whether it's length, whether it's color, whether it's what we did to it this morning. Uh, and the lab testing between the three major labs that do hair um, it is different. Each one kind of cracks that in a different way. They're all using very similar technologies from a screening confirmation perspective, but how they treat the sample when they get it as it goes through their accessioning and, and how they wash the hair, what they do with those washes, how they digest the hair to get into a liquid state, all is different between those labs. And then there still is this, you know, overarching, is there a color bias? You know, there were studies shown that after you use a unit dotus of codeine, people with dark hair had more codeine in their hair than people with red hair or lighter color hair. So the HHS still needs to look at that and look at it from a real world drug use perspective and say, is that, you know, is that color bias true or is it kind of manufactured based on some of those, those studies that have been done? So here's the final, you know, recommendations, and I'm sure everybody looks like my dog who retired at four months of age. Um, you know, everybody's waiting for this to get over. So from a drug-free workplace, uh, you know, program perspective, really consider alternate specimen uh, if you haven't already because I think there's a great utility for both hair and oral fluid testing uh, for people's programs out there. And really, specimen selection is dependent upon how you configure your drug-free workplace program. So if you're uh, a client out there um, that only does pre-employment uh, programs and really doesn't have any sort of current employee, you know, current employee screening program, you know, what I would strongly recommend is that you use hair. And the reason for that is the highest donor fear factor as well as the long detection window. You're going to have the test that goes back the longest, so you'll be able to, so to speak, gauge that use. For clients out there that have, you know, very robust incumbent testing programs, so you have a random program, you have, you know, reasonable suspicion, you know, uh, so to speak, program in place with training around it so your supervisors know when to engage it, um, you know, uh, you know, all of a sudden really consider oral fluid, particularly if you're in static facilities like distribution centers, like manufacturers, you know, and then there still is utility for urine. Urine still gives you a return on investment. You know, so there's other programs out there that may be variable that you may want to consider, hey, urine's still our specimen because of this or this reason. We need a dynamic clinic network because we onboard from all over the country and we don't have static facilities. Great, urine's a great specimen for that. You know, uh, hair would be a great specimen for that. So kind of work with a provider that can offer you all of the different uh, specimens and really can act as that trusted advisor or consultant to you. You know, uh, next one, I've already addressed this slide earlier, but, you know, know where you are from a decriminalized marijuana perspective and know how you need to address you know, that accommodation process, whether it's part of your policy or whether it's, it's mandated by a state like Arizona, you really need to know, you know, prior to having the first person come forward, how you're going to handle that from a, a risk mitigation and an employment law perspective. So that's really, you know, the end of my webinar here. I'll kind of turn it back over uh, to Corey for closing comments and then questions. Thank you, Dr. Sima. So at this time, we'll go ahead and open it up uh, just for a few questions. I know we're, we're a little limited on time here. Uh, so go ahead and use the Q&A widget that's at the bottom of your screen to type any of your questions. And for any questions we're unable to answer live on the call uh, right now, we'll be, be sure to follow up with you after the webinar to have those addressed.
So Dr. Stima, just a, just a few questions before we will conclude here. Uh, one of these is if you have any new data regarding the return on investment regarding it, having a drug screening program. Oh, the, no, that's a great question. So, you know, uh, you know, when I first came to higher right, the figure that was used that was kind of vetted through a variety of government sources was an illicit drug user on average costs the company around $11,000 a year. The Obama administration, very early in this administration, uh, had a great deal of studies and works on what illicit drug users cost the economy and cost employers. So that figure, as of 10 years ago, was vetted at a figure of around $14,000 per year, you know, uh, per illicit drug user. And again, that's kind of an average overall. Well, over the last few years, the University of Chicago, in conjunction with the National Safety Council, actually has put out what they call a return on investment calculator for drug-free workplace programs. So this is something that if you kind of Google, you know, National Safety Council, you know, return on investment drug-free workplace, that you'll actually be brought to this where you can put in the size of your company, location of your company. There's some parameters that they'll – and it'll actually spit out a figure that that is consistent with the size of your organization as well as the industry in which you practice in where it will be variable, where you'll see that some companies may be as low as you know, ten or $12,000 and other companies will have you know, uh, the cost of an illicit drug user may be fifty or $60,000, so it's variable. But that's something that you can use to calculate uh, that um, you know, yourself for your type of business. You know, from a higher right perspective, with the, when I'm meeting with our clients, just because it's hard for me to know all of your statistics, I you still use the fourteen thousand dollar mark because when I've used the calculator, I always get a figure that's higher than that. So I'm always going to present the so to speak, worst case scenario in regards to the return on investment and risk mitigation your program shows. But even at $14,000, it, it's an enormous return on investment from a drug-free workplace program perspective. Thank you, sir. Another question here from your professional experience. What is the best drug screening specimen? Well, I wish I could just say there is one specimen, and as, as I kind of went through from a best practices perspective, I think there's a utility for all three specimens out there. Um, you know, I believe there's, a, you know, uh, there are clients where the hair test is, is by far the best test. There's also clients out there that oral fluid testing may be the best test. You just have to have the program set up and know what your needs are because every drug-free workplace program needs to be predicated upon deterrence. To deter, you have to detect, but it, it's really a deterrence-based program. The best drug screen that you ever do is the one that you never collect, the one where the guy goes, you know what, these guys seem to be taking this drug screening thing real serious, and I like to do drugs, so therefore I'm not going to even apply with them. I'm going to go down the road to apply to a company that doesn't do this. So from that perspective, you just have to know what your goals are as an organization and then partner with, a, with someone that can you know, look at your program holistically, look at how you onboard, look at how you manage your program after they become, uh, you know, uh, become an employee and make some, you know, uh, help make you decisions on saying, yeah, this is the way I think you should run it with this specimen here and that specimen there. <laughs> and then look at that and then make the decision that meets your business needs. Good deal. Thank you, sir. I think that may be all the time that we will be able to address questions on the webinar today. Uh, but we would please request that uh, the attendees here take our short survey. Uh, it, it is something that we greatly appreciate the feedback on uh, regarding today's webinar as well as the future sessions as well. Um, otherwise, we'd like to thank everyone for attending today's presentation, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day.